thank you for coming to the memorial service for Ron Plocker. We are here today with sorrow mixed with joy and sadness mingled with hope. We sorrow because in the days and years ahead, we're going to miss Ron. But this sorrow is filled with hope and joy because of Jesus. We sorrow because we love Ron. We'll miss him as a husband, as a father. We'll miss him as a friend. But Ron's wife and children, Ron's church family, his friends, are not only sorrowful, we have hearts filled with joy because as much as we love Ron and as much as we will miss Ron, we know that Jesus loves him more. Jesus loved Ron so much that he died to make him his own. And we are rejoicing that Ron, right now, Ron is experiencing the loving presence of his Savior. So today we're gathered with grateful hearts to remember the life and friendship and, and happy times we've had with Ron. But we want this service today to be more than just about remembering Ron's life. More than remembering Ron and the good times we had with him, we want to see Jesus. Ron's savior and friend, shepherd. Because Jesus led and encouraged, protected. Jesus died and rose again for Ron and for you. So we're gathering to remember Ron and to look to Jesus who alone delivers from sin and death. And it's our prayer, it's my prayer, it's Carol's prayer, it's Ron's family's prayer that everyone here will love and trust Jesus. So thank you for being here. The, the family would love, would love to express their deep felt thanks and appreciation for all the cards and all the phone calls and all the encouragement that they've re received from you and their, their friends, their family, the loved ones around them. So thank you for the encouragement that you've given to the family this week. But would you pray for me, pray with me as we begin. Father, we will bless you at all times, and our praise shall continually be in our mouths. Our souls make their boasts in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. As the psalmist says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And Father, that's what we want in this moment. We want every heart to find their joy and gladness and boast in God the Father. So, so God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for the life that Ron lived. We thank you that he walked with you and trusted you. We thank you for being his savior and shepherd. And we thank you for the opportunity now to remember his life and to remember the blessing that you have given to us in Ron. But God, we look to you as our creator and as our God. We look to you as the one who gives and the one who takes away. Help us bless your name forever. We thank you for this service. We thank you for Ron and we thank you for Jesus. And we pray these things in his name, amen. Our service today is not simply a memorial service, thinking back on what we knew and loved about Ron. We want this to be a service where God is praised. So there's going to be some songs and some testimonies. Greg is going to lead us in our first song, Be Unto Your Name. Would you stand with us as Greg leads? And let's sing out to God our Savior.
be unto your name. Be unto your name. We are the broken. You are the healer. Freedom was revealed. My song will sing forever bowing before you blessing your name holy holy Lord God almighty worthy the Lamb who was slain Fifty-one through fifty-eight. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Hello, my name is Matt. I'm Ron and Carol's son. And, you know, I'm frequently asked if I'm the only son, and the answer to that is yes. They took one look at me and decided that one was plenty. Now, before you judge me for starting out this with a joke, I think that most of you who know Dad well will admit that no remembrance of him would be complete without at least some wit or attempted humor. Won't make any promises, though. So, if, a funny story about this is um, a few years ago, I was working with a young man, and he said to me, he said, you think you're funny, don't you? Well, I may not be, but I know my dad was. One of his favorite jokes growing up is he would say that our dog is very religious. He's Catholic. You can decide whether or not you think it's funny, but it is what it is. In all seriousness, though, Dad did have this amazing ability to add levity and humor to almost any situation, and it's something that we're truly going to miss. So where should I start talking about Dad? There's so many things. Could start with the wood carving, which hopefully a number of you will have a chance or have already seen. Some of you may not know that he actually taught himself how to carve by reading books from the library. And just as a little parenthesis here for those of you who don't know, if you're too young, a library is where you go, there are books, <laughs> there are paper, you read them and you hopefully learn. So I think mom would want me to get that pitch in there for her <laughs> and for all the other library people who are here. And I think, you know, Dad really, he loved carving and it was a great way for him to show God's creativity through his work. Or maybe it would be metal detecting, one of his more recent hobbies. It was perfect for him. He was able to be outside and exploring and hiking and digging holes in the park lawn. Don't worry, he covered them up, he said. So we'll, we'll take his word for it. And I think any judge of a metal detector is their greatest find. 
and he did actually find the one ring from the Lord of the Rings. So he has that at home. I thought it was burned up in fire, but turns out that was fake news. So it could be his love for kids. He was so quick to make friends with all the little people that he met. It could be his enjoyments of science fiction, both written and movies. He especially liked the B movies from the 50s and 60s, where I think the most horrifying thing was actually the costumes and makeup, not really the story itself. But he liked thinking about the future, and it's where I actually got my love for reading as well. Or it could be hiking. It's something that, you know, some people are content to drive to where they're going to go, and, but Dad was not that. He liked to be out and close, up close and personal with nature, and Mom was a great thing that they were able to do together. Um, just recently on a trip to Arizona, they hiked up to the top of Camelback Mountain, which is actually where this picture was taken. It sounds calm and peaceful, but it's actually an incredibly dangerous hike. They basically have an ambulance parked at the bottom, but they actually made it all the way up and down in one piece without using the ambulance. So that's a, a great testimony of their um, endurance and the fun that they had with that. Or it could be dad as provider. He got his first, I would say, real job in 1972 at the ripe old age of 19 at Animal Fair for $2.25 an hour, which apparently is more than some people made. But if you do the math, if you're bad at math like me, it's $90 a week or about $4,700 a year. So my have times changed since that. But he selflessly provided for our family up until just a few years ago when he retired. And I think it's an amazing testimony of God's work in his life. Or he could talk about his love for animals. He especially loved dogs, but he found a place in his heart for many furry friends, like cats, which is hard to believe, but, and uh, sheep and other farm animals. He always enjoyed petting and being close with them as well. Or it could be drawing. Don't tell pastor, but sometimes the bulletins would be filled with notes by the end of the service. Don't worry, I think he was still listening. Or it could be classical music. He could listen to just a few notes of almost any song on the classical station and he could tell you who it was that wrote the song. Or gardening. I always remember him since a very young age having a garden. And even this year he planted a garden before he went into the hospital. And we're still being blessed by that. Or it could be his love of spicy foods. He was always pushing the boundaries there, and there were many tears and red faces and heartburn from that. It could be politics, but don't worry, I won't get into that here. It could be rock hunting. He could take a rock, almost any rock you could hand him, just like classical music, and he could see it and tell you what kind of rock it was and whether it was a sedimentary or metamorphic or a volcanic is amazing taught himself that as well. There could be caves. Almost every vacation, mom had to work into the itinerary a way to get to a cave. He loved seeing how God used water to carve the rock and then left behind the beautiful formations that are just so otherworldly. There could be his love of fun. Growing up, we had a great sledding hill. Neil probably remembers it. And he would go up and down the hill with me so many times, and I remember that. But, uh, just last year, we took a family trip before COVID to Orlando, and he went with me on all the crazy rides at SeaWorld, all the most extreme ones, and he just laughed the whole time. Don't worry, I'm almost done. But Dad also had great taste in food. When I was growing up, Mom worked most Thursdays at the library, and when he was in charge of the menu, it was almost always hash browns. His, it was a very expansive culinary taste, but he also loved popcorn, and he would make popcorn by the mountain, and he would take that with him to work, and he loved it so much it even cost him a few molars. <laughs> so yes, all of these things are really important parts of who dad was, and is, but the most important thing is that he loved Jesus. Was dad perfect? No, of course not, nobody is, but he was God's new creation, a new work through his spirit. God changed Dad's life from a rowdy teenager 
into a faithful and loving husband and father. And I think some of the clearest evidence that I remember, or a scene of that, I remember growing up, the family devotions, the family reading of scripture. We memorized parts of James together, actually good parts in the book of James, and I still remember that to this day. I think the verses from 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 apply well to Dad. I fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, and in the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And that day has already come for Dad. Dad has gone to a place that has been prepared for him with Christ. And we eagerly anticipate seeing him again in glory. So, Dad, be, thank you for being an example of faith, both steadfast and immovable, helping me become the man I am today. Your labor was not in vain in the Lord. We will miss you, miss your presence, your humor, your joy. Lord, we're glad that you are in the ever-loving arms of the Savior. Thank you. Carol was able to take some time this week and write down some of the things that she was thankful for about Ron and their time together as husband and wife. She's asked that I would read that for her. I wanted to take a minute to tell you about the ways Ron showed his love to me. He loved Jesus and modeled Christ for me and our son Matt and when he married our daughter-in-law Susie, as well as many others whose lives he touched. He prayed with me before every meal and always thanked me for the meal and said it was delicious, even if it wasn't. He loved going to church and would often discuss the sermons with me. Or if there was a hard passage in God's word I was struggling to understand, he would share his thoughts. In difficult circumstances, he was always calm and his perspective was always wise. He could fix almost anything, maybe not the first time or the second time, but he never gave up. He was patient. On every birthday, anniversary, and Valentine's Day, he used his God-given creativity to make me a homemade card, wood carving, or drawing to show his love for me. He gave great hugs. He made me coffee every morning. He told me I was pretty and made me feel special. Now, if you have been not been paying attention this whole time, I'd like to remind you that Carol is the one who wrote this. <laughs> or if you just joined the live stream... Ron never told me I was pretty. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that, actually. He loved children and taught pre-kindergarten Sunday school with me for years. He appreciated God's creation and spent a lot of time outdoors. He loved gardening and watching things grow. He enjoyed watching storms while I was hiding in the basement. He saw God's creative hand everywhere, in the mountains and oceans, and all the things that God had made. He adored my mom, his mother-in-law, and lovingly helped me care for her for many years. He enjoyed adventures and would go anywhere with me. He went on mission trips to Jamaica and Tanzania. The national parks were a favorite destination for hiking, exploring, and camping. We traveled around the United States and visit, visited 48 of the 50 states. God allowed us to travel to Europe several times. Ron loved art and antiquities. We've, we spent time on Mars Hill contemplating what Paul had preached there. His joys, joy on these trips was contagious. God gifted him with creativity. He loved to fashion jewelry out of stones, doodle and draw, and in the last 15 years or so, carved wood. He often shared these gifts by teaching others or by hiding little wood carvings in someone's house when we visited. You can actually see a number of Ron's carvings on the table, and the family would ask that you take one if you would like on your way out today. Ron loved classical music and knew almost every piece. He could name that tune as any classical musician and shared that love of music with me. Ron was fun-loving and had an amazing sense of humor. He was famous for his one-line quick-witted responses that he delivered with a straight face. People would ponder, was he kidding? He almost always was, and he made me laugh. Was he perfect? No. But in Christ, he was forgiven, 
and forgiving to me. He was my soulmate from God, and I praise God that because of his redeeming grace and forgiveness of our sins in Christ, Ron is now in glory with him. In Christ, Ron was forgiven. And we want to sing about that together. If you'd stand with us one more time, we're going to sing In Christ Alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, fair through the fall with drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in thriftless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, by the ones he came to save. To what heights of cross was Jesus died. The wrath of God was satisfied. My every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he grows again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost his grip on me. Precious blood of God. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell. No scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. You may be seated. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 17 through 27. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. 
I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When I was meeting with the family after Ron's passing, we discussed the scriptures we would like to read and the passage that would like to be preached. And uh, we, we looked at 1 Peter 1 together. And the verses are going to be on the screen. And I think this, these, this passage and this selection speaks to the, the joy and hope that Carol and Matt and Susie have continually expressed as they've walked through these hard days. It's a fitting passage for what we want to see together today. And if you can read it on the screen, I'll be reading these verses. You can follow along. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your, save, uh, outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As a pastor, one of my greatest privileges is walking with people through moments of pain and suffering. In these moments, it is encouraging that the Bible, that scripture, is not naively optimistic about what life would look like. As we read 1 Peter 1, we recognize that this passage, and, and really all of the Bible, is written by people who suffer, to people who suffer, about the hope, about the joy that we have in Jesus in the middle of our suffering. As we read 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter is realistic about suffering and sorrow. In fact, all of the Bible is realistic about the suffering and sorrow that you and I are going to endure. And I have been privileged to walk, through, walk in this suffering with Carol, with Matt, with Susie, as they've demonstrated this kind of joy. But, but while the Bible is realistic about our sorrow, its central message is a pronouncement of good news of great joy to all of us who face suffering. In fact, if, the, if there's one verse that summarizes the memorial service today, it, it might be verse 6, that in this, in this good news of great joy, you rejoice Though now for a little while you experience suffering, you're grieved by various trials. We are grieved because of the separation of death, but we have unspeakable joy. And the question I want to ask and answer from this passage is why? Why do we experience joy today in the face of trials? As you've talked with Carol over the last week, as you've talked with Matt and Susie, you've seen joy and hope radiate from them. Why? Why do they have that experience? In fact, I think this is the question we all need to wrestle with. What gives people joy in the face of trials? Why do we have hope in the middle of all of our sorrow? The answer to that question explodes from this passage. It's because of a message. We have hope in the middle of our trials because of a, of a pronouncement that has been made, a message that defines all of our reality. In fact, defines all of reality, and in that message, it's the gospel. God's 
redeeming love in Jesus for broken, sinful people. As you read 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9, we see in these verses three reasons for joy in the face of sorrow, suffering, and sadness. 1 Peter 1 teaches us that in Jesus, all of us have a living hope and an eternal inheritance and an invincible power. In verse 3, the Peter wants us to see that in Christ you have a living hope. Peter begins this paragraph by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has, been ca- he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And how does this living hope come to us? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The central truth of the gospel is that Jesus, God's son, came into the earth and died on the cross to take your sin penalty and payment. Central to the gospel is the historical fact that Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave in power. And because Jesus rose from the dead, Because Jesus is alive today, everyone who trusts in him has a hope that is alive. It is a living hope. And why is that hope alive? Because Christ is alive. Jesus died and rose again. And the believer, the one who trusts in him, no longer lives under the fear of sin and death because Christ has risen like the sun rising and breaking in and beating back the darkness, the risen Christ shines victoriously over sin and death. And if you trust in him today, that hope is alive. That hope is living because your Savior is alive. The death and resurrection of Jesus are real historical displays, not only of God's power and triumph over sin and death, But the resurrection and death of Christ are real historical displays of God's mercy and grace and kindness. Why has God given new life to everyone who trusts in Jesus? Because he is a God who shows mercy. Jesus is a savior who died on the cross and his His mercy is displayed in saving us from our sin. But more, Jesus is a Savior who rose again so that he could save us and say of all of us, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the debt and penalty of all your sin. He died on the cross, and in his death, he paid all. Everything that your, every debt that your sin had incurred. And in his death, he didn't just start the work of salvation for you. He finished it. He paid it all. Jesus died on the cross, and in his death, he doesn't say, I started it, now you get the rest done. Jesus died, and in his last breath said, it is finished. Those words mean that you can receive Jesus by faith. And get all of the mercy and all of the grace and all of the salvation that your soul could ever need. And as Peter points to us over and over again in this passage, you receive that merciful salvation. You receive the gift that Jesus died to give you by faith. It is believing this promise that makes the one difference for you. In fact, as we've heard testimonies from Ron's life, It's Ron's belief in this promise that made the biggest difference for him. He saw himself not as a good person who earned what Jesus had done, but Ron saw himself as a sinner in desperate need of grace. And Ron knew that if he was going to be saved by Jesus, it would be by Jesus' mercy alone. So Ron entrusted his soul into Jesus' care. And the invitation 
to do that is for all of us. How can we have hope and joy in the face of a, a, of a loved one passing? It's because we know that Ron trusted Jesus and that because Jesus lives, Ron lives. And the same can be said of all of us. That if you trust in Jesus, because Jesus lives, you can live. You can have eternal life. You can have this living hope. So friend, Jesus came and he died for you in love on the cross. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he died and rose again? Because you're invited to trusting in Jesus today. So maybe you've never done that. Maybe you've never heard the good news about what Jesus has done for you. Or maybe you've trusted in your own goodness. Friend, see the love and mercy of God today. Turn and trust in Jesus. Believe that Christ died for your sins and that he was buried and rose again on the third day for you. So if you don't trust in Christ, there's an invitation. If you've never trusted in Christ, there's an invitation for you today to, to believe, to believe the message of the gospel. But if you are a Christian, if you share in Ron's faith, if you share in the family's faith, then we come and we recognize that today is a day of worship and praise. This is the day where we worship and praise God for the living hope that he has given to us through Jesus. We have a living hope because the Son of God died for us. We have a living hope because Jesus defeated death by rising from the dead. We have a living hope because Christ drained the wrath of God so that we could swim in the oceans of God's unending mercy. We have a living hope because one day we know that Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eyes. On that day, the suffering and sorrow we've experienced will make sense. It will be worth it. On that day, like today, we will worship Jesus as our Savior. So we have joy in the face of sorrow because in Jesus and because of God's mercy, we have a living hope. We have a hope that is alive today with Christ. Second, we have hope and joy in the face of sorrow today because we have in an eternal inheritance. In verse 4, we are born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. We have joy and hope because we know that Ron has received an inheritance that can never be taken away, and we have joy and hope because we know we share in that inheritance in Christ. Verse 4. In verse 4, the, the, Peter describes the inheritance in, in, in words that largely describe it from a negative standpoint, right? This inheritance is imperishable. It can never be destroyed. This inheritance is undefiled. There is nothing that can ever taint it or spoil it. And this inheritance in Christ is unfading. It will, it will never wither or dry up. We have hope in trouble today. We have hope in trouble today because we know of what we have tomorrow. We have an inheritance that will never go away. The temporary pain we feel will one day shrivel up in the light of everlasting joy. If there's one thing that Peter emphasizes in this passage, is that our joy will be eternal. Our pain, temporary. Our suffering, for a moment. But our joy, our inheritance in Jesus is forever. Robert Louis Stevenson's poem, When the Stars Are Gone, is a helpful reflection on the eternal hope and the eternal joy that we have in the face of our momentary sorrow. He writes, the stars shine over the mountains. The stars shine over the sea. The stars look up to the mighty God. The stars look down on me. 
The star shall last for a million years, a million years and a day. But God and I will live and love when the stars have passed away. Why do we have hope and joy in the face of sorrow today? Because we know that our joy, our inheritance in Christ will last forever. Finally, we have joy and hope in the middle of sorrow because you have an invincible power. In verse 5, we're pointed to God's power at work for us. We are being protected by a God who lacks nothing, by a God who has all power. Peter points us to that in verse 5, that we have been born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that's undefiled, that's eternal. And those of us who have received that inheritance or who will receive that inheritance are by God's power being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. Ron's salvation is secure because he was kept and protected and guarded by God. He was grabbed and wrapped up in the loving arms of a heavenly father who would never let him go by a father who would never fail him, who would protect him from ultimately from sin and death. So we have hope, we have joy that Ron is in heaven with Jesus right now because he trusted in Jesus and gained the life from Jesus that he could never lose. We have hope and joy right now because we know that God himself, the creator of the heavens and earth, that God was guarding and protecting him. Now we know, you might be surprised by the, by the confidence with which we're speaking about Ron's salvation. We know that Ron's with Jesus. And we're not saying this confidently because we looked at Ron and saw a perfect individual. Right? We're, we're, we don't have this confidence because we saw that Ron was a great person. In fact, we heard from Carol and we heard from Matt, people really close to Ron, that he wasn't perfect, that he sinned and, and struggled. We aren't confident that Ron is with Jesus because Ron was great. We know that Ron is in heaven because he had a great Savior. He had a powerful God that had the power to give him new life and the power to keep him and protect him and guard him and ultimately save him in the end. We have this hope that because of Jesus, we know that, joy, that death does not have the last word for Ron, and we know that death does not have the last word for us. Ron is protected by God from sin and death, by the risen Christ, and by a heavenly Father whose love never fails. The 18th century poem shares this unabashed hope for us. That for Ron, death is not the last word. For us, death is not the last word. For everyone who trusts in Christ, death is not the end. It is simply the entrance to infinite, unending joy into the loving arms of your Savior. The poem goes on to say, It is not death to die, to leave this weary road and join the saints who dwell on high, who found their home with God. It is not death to fling aside this earthly dust and rise with strong and noble wing to live among the just. It is not death to close the eyes long dimmed by tears and wake in joy before your throne delivered from our fears. It is not death to hear the key unlock the door that sets us free from mortal years to praise you evermore. Oh, Jesus, Conquering the grave, your precious blood has power to save. Those who trust in you will in your mercy find that it is not death to die. Those words are true today of Ron, and they are true today of everyone who trusts in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the mercy.
mercy that you have shown us in Christ. And today we commend to you, Ron, our husband, father, brother, and friend, and, and we entrust him to you and into your loving care. We pray that you would be with his family today, that you would encourage them and strengthen them as they mourn the loss of someone that they loved dearly. We pray that everyone here would put their full weight, their full confidence, their full trust in Jesus. And we pray that all of us would come to Jesus as the resurrection and the life. We would come to Jesus and see him as our hope alone for our eternal life. We thank you that in Jesus, death is a defeated enemy. We thank you that we know based on your promises that Ron is free from suffering and pain and enjoying the full joy of your presence. We say with scripture, we know our Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after our bodies have been destroyed, yet in our flesh, we will see God. And our eyes will behold him, and not another. We thank you for the confidence and hope and joy we have, knowing that Jesus lives. We pray that these, we would trust and believe in this message today. Thank you for all of your goodness to us in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us as we sing Amazing Grace to close? days to sing in God's praise when when we first began. The psalmist says in Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, and friend one, friend, one day it will, but 
I hope the family hopes that you can say with Ron, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Amen. Let's be dismissed in that hope today. Thank you for coming. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You can have a, a seat as we wait to be dismissed. coming today. Uh, it was a blessing for Carol and her family to, for you to be here. So we thank you very much. There's going to be a lunch right after, right, right now. So if we, in just a moment, we're going to have you dismissed and we're going to refresh the room and get set up for lunch. So please stay for lunch. We have plenty of food. But again, thank you and you can go and just greet Carol and her family out there right now. So thank you for coming.